four. L'ennemi écoute. As two weeks later, James Bond awoke in his room at the Hotel Splendide, some of this history passed through his mind. He had arrived at Royal Izzo in time for luncheon two days before. There had been no attempt to contact him, and there had been no flicker of curiosity when he had signed the register James Bond, Port Maria, Jamaica. M had expressed no interest in his cover. Once you start to make a settled sheaf at the tables, you'll have had it, he said, but wear a cover that will stick with the general public. Bond knew Jamaica well, so he had asked to be controlled from there and to pass as a Jamaican plantocrat whose father had made his pile in tobacco and sugar and whose son chose to play it away in the stock markets and in casinos. If inquiries were made, he would quote Charles de Silva of Shaffrey's Kingston as his attorney. Charles would make the story stick. Bond had spent the last two afternoons and most of the nights at the casino playing complicated progression systems on the even chances at roulette. He made a high banco at Chemin de Fer whenever he heard one offer. If he lost, he would sous once and not chase it further if he lost the second time. In this way, he had made some three million francs and had given his nerves and card sense a thorough workout. He had got the geography of the casino clear in his mind, and above all, he had been able to observe the sheep at the tables and to note ruefully that he was a faultless and lucky gambler. Bond liked to make a good breakfast. After a cold shower, he sat at the writing table in front of the window. He looked out at the beautiful day and consumed half a pint of iced orange juice, three scrambled eggs and bacon, and a double portion of coffee without sugar. He lit his first cigarette, a Balkan and Turkish mixture made for him by Morelands of Grosvenor Street, and watched the small waves lick the long seashore and the fishing fleet from Jet string out towards the June heat haze, followed by a paper chase of herring gulls. He was lost in his thoughts when the telephone rang. It was the concierge announcing that a director of Radio Stentor was waiting below with the wireless set he had ordered from Paris. Of course, said Bond. Send him up. This was the cover fixed by the Deuxième Bureau for their liaison man with Bond. Bond watched the door, hoping it would be Matisse. When Matisse came in, a respectable businessman carrying a large square parcel by its leather handle, Bond smiled broadly and would have greeted him with warmth if Matisse had not frowned and held up his free hand after carefully closing the door. I have just arrived from Paris, monsieur, and here is the set you asked to have on approval. Five valves. Superhet, I think you call it in England. And you should be able to get most of the capitals of Europe from Royale. There are no mountains for forty miles in any direction. It sounds all right, said Bond, lifting his eyebrows at this mystery-making. Matisse paid no attention. He placed the set, which he had unwrapped, on the floor beside the unlit panel electric fire below the mantelpiece. It is just past eleven, he said, and I can see that the Compagnon de la Chanson should now be on the medium wave from Rome. They are touring Europe. Let us see what the reception is like. It should be a fair test. He winked. Bond noted that he had turned the volume on to full, and the red light indicating the long wave band was illuminated, though the set was still silent. Matisse fiddled at the back of the set. Suddenly, an appalling roar of static filled the small room. Matisse gazed at the set for a few seconds with benevolence, and then turned it off, and his voice was full of dismay. My dear monsieur, forgive me, please. Badly tuned. And he again bent to the dials. After a few adjustments, the close harmony of the French came over the air, and Matisse walked up and clapped Bond very hard on the back, and rang his hand until Bond's fingers ached. Bond smiled back at him. Now, what the hell? he asked. My dear friend, Matisse was delighted. You are blown, blown, blown. Up there, he pointed at the ceiling. At this moment, either Monsieur Muntz or his alleged wife, allegedly bedridden with the grip, is deafened, absolutely deafened, and I hope in agony. He grinned with pleasure at Bond's frown of disbelief. Matisse sat down on the bed and ripped open a packet of caper out of his thumbnail. Bond waited. Matisse was satisfied with the sensation his words had caused. He became serious. How it has happened, I don't know. They must have been on to you for several days before you arrived. The opposition is here in real strength. Above you is the Muntz family. He is German. She is from somewhere in Central Europe. Perhaps a Czech. This is an old-fashioned hotel. There are disused chimneys behind these electric fires. Just here, he pointed a few inches above the panel fire, is suspended a very powerful radio pickup. The wires run up the chimney to behind the Munz's electric fire, where there is an amplifier. In their room is a wire recorder and a pair of earphones on which the Munz's listen in turn. That is why Madame Munz has the grip and takes all her meals in bed, and why Monsieur Munz has to be constantly at her side instead of enjoying the sunshine and gambling of this delightful resort. Some of this we knew because in France we are very clever. The rest we confirmed by unscrewing your electric fire a few hours before you got here. Suspiciously, Bond walked over and examined the screws which secured the panel to the wall. Their grooves showed minute scratches. Now it is time for a little more play acting, said Matisse. He walked over to the radio, which was still transmitting close harmony to its audience of three, and switched it off. Are you satisfied, monsieur? he asked. You notice how clearly they came over. Are they not a wonderful team? He made a winding motion with his right hand and raised his eyebrows. They are so good, said Bond, that I would like to hear the rest of the program. He grinned at the thought of the angry glances which the Munces must be exchanging overhead. The machine itself seems splendid. Just what I was looking for to take back to Jamaica. Matisse made a sarcastic grimace and switched back to the Rome program. You and your Jamaica, he said, and sat down again on the bed. Bond frowned at him. Well, it's no use crying over spilt milk, he said. We didn't expect the cover to stick for long, but it's worrying that they bowled it out so soon. He searched his mind in vain for a clue. Could the Russians have broken one of our ciphers? If so, he might just as well pack up and go home. He and his job would have been stripped naked. Matisse seemed to read his mind. It can't have been a cipher, he said. Anyway, we told London at once, and they will have changed them. A pretty flap we caused, I can tell you. He smiled with the satisfaction of a friendly rival. And now to business, before our good compagnol ran out of breath. First of all, and he inhaled a thick lungful of caporal, you will be pleased with your number two. She is very beautiful. Bond frowned. Very beautiful indeed. 
Satisfied with Bond's reaction, Matisse continued, She has black hair, blue eyes, and splendid, er, protuberances. Front and back, he added. And she is a wireless expert, which, though sexually less interesting, makes her a perfect employee of Radio Stentor, and an assistant to myself in my capacity as wireless salesman for this rich summer season down here, he grinned. We are both staying in the hotel, and my assistant will thus be on hand in case your new radio breaks down. All new machines, even French ones, are apt to have teething troubles in the first day or two, and occasionally at night, he added, with an exaggerated wink. Bond was not amused. What the hell do they want to send me a woman for? He said bitterly. Do they think this is a bloody picnic? Matisse interrupted. Calm yourself, my dear James. She is as serious as you could wish, and cold as an icicle. She speaks French like a native and knows her job backwards. Her cover's perfect, and I have arranged for her to team up with you quite smoothly. What is more natural than that you should pick up a pretty girl here, as a Jamaican millionaire? He coughed respectfully. What with your hot blood and all, you would look naked without one. Bond grunted dubiously. Any other surprises? He asked suspiciously. Nothing very much, answered Matisse. The chief is installed in his villa. It's about ten miles down the coast road. He has his two guards with him. They look pretty capable fellows. One of them has been seen visiting a little pension in the town where three mysterious and rather subhuman characters checked in two days ago. They may be part of the team. Their papers are in order, stateless checks apparently, but one of our men says the language they talk in their room is Bulgarian. We don't see many of those around. They're mostly used against the Turks and the Yugoslavs. They're stupid, but obedient. The Russians use them for simple killings or as fall guys for more complicated ones. Thanks very much. Which is mine to be, asked Bond. Anything else? No. Come to the bar of the Hermitage before lunch. I'll fix the introduction. Ask her to dinner this evening. Then it will be natural for her to come into the casino with you. I'll be there too, but in the background. I've got one or two good chaps and we'll keep an eye on you. Oh, and there's an American called Leiter here, staying in the hotel. Felix Leiter. He's the CIA chap from Fontainebleau. London told me to tell you. He looks okay. May come in useful. A torrent of Italian burst from the wireless set on the floor. Matisse switched it off and they exchanged some phrases about the set and how Bond should pay for it. Then, with effusive farewells and a final wink, Matisse bowed himself out. Bond sat at the window and gathered his thoughts. Nothing that Matisse had told him was reassuring. He was completely blown and under real professional surveillance. An attempt might be made to put him away before he had the chance to pit himself against the chief of the tables. The Russians had no stupid prejudices about murder. And then there was this pest of a girl. He sighed. Women were for recreation. On a job, they got in the way and fogged things up with sex and hurt feelings and all the emotional baggage that they carried around. One had to look out for them and take care of them. Bitch, said Bond. And then remembering the Munces, he said bitch again, more loudly, and walked out.